Everybody doing all right tonight? <laughs> you know, uh, the Bible would tell us that when, the, when someone who's not saved says yes to Jesus and gets saved, that the angels in heaven, they rejoice and there's like a party in heaven. Just wondering if maybe you'd like to participate in that. <laughs> this is Kim. M many of you know Kim. Um, she's been here at our church for uh, quite a while now, and uh, our dear friend has been through, uh, can I just say this, she's just been through hell and back, right? And, uh, but she still smiles, man, I don't know, she's, she must know something, um, but she's decided tonight that she wants to be baptized, and uh, I don't know, do you, do you want to say anything? No? Can I share something? Okay. Um, so she was, she was sprinkled in baptism younger. I don't know how old you were when that happened, but um, she came up to me the other night and she said, I was just wondering, if, is this me or is this God talking? Because I feel like I'm supposed to go under. And, and, and going under doesn't, let me just tell you something, going under doesn't save you. I filled this water from the hose out back. It's not holy like out of the Jordan River or something, okay? This is water from the, from the hose. <clears throat> so uh, here's the deal with her baptism. She was saved. She has a great relationship with the Lord, actually, and has for many, many years. But as she reads the scripture, she sees something there that the Lord says we're supposed to do. And out of obedience, he was pulling on her heart. And out of obedience to that tug, she's like, you know what? If it says fully wet, immersion, that's what I want to do. So I don't have anything that's getting in the way of my relationship with him. Amen? That's what you're witnessing here tonight. Radical obedience to God's word. Okay? So if you don't mind, please. Would you like to have a seat? You're going to be able to crisscross so you can go back? All right. Would you guys do me, a, would, you, would you just bow your heads and just let's pray for, for a moment um, for Kim? Uh, Lord, I, I just want to thank you for my friend. Um, I thank you for who she is. Like I, I love everyone here at this church, Lord, but this, this lady right here, Lord, her, her uh, authenticity and just that genuine relationship with the Lord that's, that's sometimes just raw and real. And it's just awesome. It's so invigorating. Uh, and it's just helpful for us all. And so I thank you. Uh, I'm just the mouthpiece right now, Lord. There's so many in this church that could be saying the same thing. Uh, but I'm saying it for them now, Lord. We're just thankful that you've chosen as in your divine providence to place your body together perfectly that you chose this church to place Kim in and she's a blessing to us. Lord, I, I pray that uh, from this day forward that the next part of her life would be so much greater than the first part of her life. Uh, that her blessings, whatever the enemy would, might have taken from her, Lord, that you would multiply blessing upon blessing upon her. Help her to be an awesome woman of God in every way. Help her to be a great godly mother to her children. And Lord, I pray that, that, that they would have their eyes open to who she really is. Um, someone who no longer lives, but that Christ lives in her. And that they would be attracted to you, Lord Jesus, through their mother. So we thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Kim, who is your one and only Lord and Savior? Based on that confession, I now bury you with Christ. You'll be raised from the dead, just like he, because you trusted in the mighty power of God that raised Christ from the dead. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Awesome. Praise God. Praise God. Would you like another? We have towels aplenty. Here you go, young lady. All right, let's give it up for God one more time. Incredible. And it's just so neat to see him working. Um, that's the question we need to answer. Um, before we get into that, I just wanted to uh, acknowledge what, what, uh, what you just saw happen here with, with Kim. 
Um, a lot of times people talk about building the church so that we could reach more people for Jesus, and that's important. Um, but it's in the generosity of the, of the giver where, where something like that happened, where um, already saved, um, but through your generosity, you provide, or should I say, God provides through you a place of restoration for those that are hurt. And if you've known Kim for as long as I have, you've seen her continence completely change since she started coming here. And so through this generosity, when that plate goes around, that's what you're doing. You're, you're providing a place of hope and restoration for people. And so um, I just want to thank you uh, for your generosity. All right, and, and I believe with all my heart that if we would hear the voice of God in our prayer time and give accordingly, that we, this church will be provided for more than sufficiently, and it will be uh, fully funded, if you will, to reach beyond its walls with the gospel of Jesus Christ, if we would just give according. So, uh, that being said, I'd like to uh, jump into God's word um, I want to start by saying we're studying the Gospel of Luke, and, and here's why we've been studying the Gospel of Luke. Uh, Jesus said that God is searching for worshipers. That should get you a little bit excited for after the message, to, to, because he's looking for you. He's looking uh, from his throne in heaven. He's looking down upon Revolution Church, and he's like, I wonder who's going to worship me tonight. So, so he's giving you the opportunity to make your daddy happy. So he said, I'm, I'm looking for worshipers who will worship me in spirit and in truth. That means that before that their life can get on fire for me and they can worship me aggressively, we need to have some truth about who he is. Because I don't know about you, but I don't want to worship some fake and phony God. I don't want to worship some Google God. I don't want to worship some grandma God. I don't want to worship some God someone told me about because that God is going to fail you and you're going to be hurting. You need to only worship, here's a good place for an amen, you ready? The one true God, Jesus Christ. Right? And that's who we're endeavoring to meet and know who he is. And so we're studying through the Gospel of Luke to find out what God's word says about who Jesus really is. What he taught, what he said, what he said about himself, what he said about you, and what he said he's going to do. And so that's what we've been studying the Gospel of Luke for, to find out about Jesus. So, do me a favor. Let's, cr let's grab a copy of God's Word and put it in your hand. Uh, don't just listen to what I have to say. There's Bibles all over the place. Don't, don't sell yourself short. Don't just assume I know what I'm talking about because I got some piece of paper on the wall. I'm flawed. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you uh, to the best of my ability what God's Word says. Uh, but ultimately, it's your decision to make. And you have to, you have to take what I say and measure it against God's word. So putting your eyes on God's word is a very wise decision. And that's a great way to give him your undivided attention tonight. So phones away, Bibles open, fake Bibles are open, that's fine, electric ones. This is, I just gotta tell you, like, this right here, that's freaking me out right here, this emptiness. If anyone wants to come up and sit right here, you'd be doing the preacher a huge favor because that's freaking me out right here. I feel like i got to scream at y'all. Why does everyone sit in the back? What, do you think I'm going to call on you? I'm the only one who's going to be talking. That's what I'm talking about. There we go. There we go. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, cool, cool, cool. Now I'm a little bit more balanced. <clears throat> So grab a copy of God's Word and turn to Luke chapter 13. Now while you're turning there, and we'll be mining our dinner from that text tonight, we'll be in other places too, but that's our main text. Let me ask you guys a question. Does anyone know what the gross national product is? <clears throat> All right, awesome. What's that? No, not the number, what it is, what it stands for. Okay. So here's what it stands for. The gross national product is the total value of goods produced and services provided in the United States of America during a calendar year. That's what it is. Um, if I told you it was uh, $5 trillion, would you say that's a lot? 
Okay. Um, I graduated high school in 1987. Now, that makes me right in the middle of, the, of my life, and I'm getting there. I still feel young at times. Um, but, you know, in the scheme of things, 1987 wasn't that long ago, was it? No, it wasn't. In 1987, the gross national product was $5 trillion. How many people have lived in this area for 30 years plus? Raise your hand. Okay. Do you remember, in your memory right now, you can think about it, what 441 looked like 30 years ago? Right? What was there? Starts with an N. Nothing. There was orange groves. And, and, and there was no Walmart. And from what I understand, about 20 years ago, there was nothing except maybe the Winn-Dixie here in Tavares. It was like nothing. Just a barren stretch of nothingness. Now, what about now? Things have changed, right? Seems like everybody owns something. The, the gross national product has snuck up a little bit. Uh, as of 2016, it's $19.1 trillion. Why in the world... Preacher, if you're going to preach the Bible, are you talking about the gross national product? Well, here's why. That's the air that we breathe. That's the world that we live in. That number indicates to me and you what our life is all about. About gathering things that we feel like we need to give us enjoyment, to satisfy our wants and our needs and fun and enjoyment, pleasure. Fulfilling all of our pleasures, that's, that's what we do. That's the life that we live. Why do you think there's all those stores up and down the road? They never stop. When you find a place that has an orange grove, you're like, man, why hasn't that been developed yet? Right? I say the same thing. It, it's, that, it's that popular now to have storefronts. And then, listen, forget the storefronts. Amazon. You have every single store on the boulevard on your phone. And you just, eBay, yeah, you can just buy stuff. And everything you need is all right there. And that's what we spend our lives doing. That's the culture that we're immersed in. And, and so because of that, my instinct is no different than your instinct. My instinct is I want to preach a message that kind of goes along with that. I want to preach a message that's going to make you happy and, and encourage you and satisfy you and bring you some enjoyment. I'm looking for a miracle to preach about. I'm looking for a, a promise of provision to preach about because that's going to take the burden off you. You're going to walk out of here a little bit lighter than when you walked in. Man, things are tough, but God's on, he's got my back. He's going to take care of it. That's what I want. That's what I want. But I'm a preacher. The Greek word for preacher is keruso. It's a herald, not of my message of someone else's message. And God's message isn't always that. It's not a message that we would, that if we were to classify it, it would be enjoyment and pleasure and satisfaction and, and happy and fun. Wouldn't be that. That's my job. And so sometimes you get to a text and here in the scripture, especially if you're a preacher who, who's trying to follow the Holy Spirit and, and follow the word of God and, and made a commitment to his church that he would not dodge issues, that he would preach what the text says no matter what, even if he was afraid to do it, even if he didn't like to do it. That's what we got here. If Jesus didn't avoid certain subjects and he preached them, then, then maybe, maybe the, this text that we're going to read here in, in, in Luke 13, starting in verse 6, maybe this text is uh, happy. Maybe this text is enjoyable. Maybe it is positive, and maybe there's pleasure in it. Maybe it is good. Perhaps we need it. Perhaps the creation, us, maybe we need to rethink our perspective on things. And, and line up our thoughts with the Creator's thoughts. Isn't that why we have the Bible? Are you like me? You would admit right now that with every single turn of the page, every single paragraph is an opportunity to be ticked off because God is in your grill about what you're doing. It's the whole Bible's like that. 
How many hoorah parties are, is God having saying, you guys got it right. Woo! Just keep doing what you're doing. Anyone ever read the Bible? Is it kind of ever like that? I read stuff in the Bible all the time. Listen, I would love to keep every bit of my income because I don't have much. And then you're telling me that I should give? Are you crazy? You're trying to tell me that that guy who just flicked me off in traffic and cut me off and took my spot, I'm supposed to be nice to him? What's wrong with you? Don't you hear the music he's playing? Be nice to him. <clears throat> he says things all the time that we don't want to hear. And it's my responsibility as the preacher to, to preach his message, not mine. Doesn't matter what I think. Doesn't matter what I like or not like. It's my job. And I want to be faithful in that job. So instead of a miracle, instead of a promise of provision that's going to make you feel better leaving out of here tonight, we got a story about a fig tree. Really? Really, God? That's what you got? Yep, that's what I got. So you guys want to read it? Okay. Does God have your attention? All right. Okay, so we're in Luke chapter 13, and... Uh, This is a tough message, guys. This is gonna, listen, don't you dare jump out of your seat. Even if you think I'm wrong, don't you dare jump out of your seat. Listen to what's said, go home, pull out your Bible, and compare what is said to the scriptures. Because it doesn't matter what I think, and it doesn't matter what you think. Because you or I are not God. There's only one, and there's only one word of God, and here it comes. <clears throat> then Jesus told a story. It's a parable, right? He's trying to teach you something that you might understand to under, so you can put your brain around something that you probably couldn't understand. So he uses some agricultural stuff. It's common. He says... Uh, a man planted a fig tree in his garden and came again and again to see if there was any fruit on it, but he was always disappointed. Finally, he said to his gardener, I've, I've waited three years and there hasn't been a single fig. Cut it down. It's just taking up space in the garden. And the gardener answered, sir, give it one more chance. Leave it another year and I'll give it special attention and plenty of fertilizer. If we get figs next year, fine. If not, then you can cut it down. You can start drawing your own conclusions as to what this all means. I'm going to try to help you with that here. This parable that Jesus teaches right here, that he shares with you and I tonight, it comes right on the heels of last week's message. It was all happening at the same time. Jesus gives an urgent call to repentance. In this, in, if you were here last week or you watched it on Facebook or whatever, you saw that, that, that he's calling people to repent or they'll perish eternally. And, and that, that, that religion and being good won't cut it, won't get it done. You have to have a change of mind. You have to rethink life. Rethink what I was thinking about. Rethink the truth about who God is and what's right and what's wrong and who I am and what I'm doing and my perspective and, and my priorities and just take some time to rethink all this. That's what repentance starts with. Rethink everything and then we recall. Not like, oh, I recall that you did that the other day. No, it's recall like a faulty product that goes to market and they realize this is wrong, this is dangerous, it could hurt people, and you start realizing because you rethought things that this life that I'm living is not good for me, it's gonna end bad, and I recall it, I bring it back, I, I rope it back in. I go, whoa, I was going down this road, and this is what I was thinking, but this was wrong, because now I agree with God's word, and God's right, and I'm wrong, and so I pull this thing in. I'm not going down that road anymore, but we don't sit there, because John the Baptist and Paul both tell us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to perform deeds in keeping with repentance. 
So what happens is you rethink everything that you're doing and everything you're thinking and you start realizing that I'm wrong and God's right and I stop doing what I'm doing but then I start living a life that shows that I've rethought things. So we start doing things a little bit differently or I should say a, a lot a bit different than what I used to do. In this parable right here of the fig tree, let me ask you a question. Is, do you guys know the, the, the other story that Jesus tells about the four soils? Raise your hand if you've ever heard that. The four soils. Let me tell you what, what I mean, like different types of dirt, soil. Okay, potting soil. So here's the story. So, so Jesus is telling, tells us that there's four different types of people in this world. There's the person who hears the word of God and, and they don't respond to it all, and, and the enemy would come and, and snatch, so I, let's just say I share the gospel with you, which is that, that you've broken God's law, you're, you're not perfect, and you need to be in glory, and so since you can't fix that, Jesus Christ, who is perfect, goes to the cross to pay for your sin and mine, and if you believe that he did that, that his perfection is now put in your account, and you can be with God forever. You just heard the gospel. And so what happens is the first soil, they don't even want to hear this. Eh, fiddlesticks, I'm done. I don't need that. I don't need no Jesus, right? No belief, no salvation. That's the soil that's as hard as this right here. So it never gets in. That's the big ball guy you were instructed to go see. Okay? We told them that if you were late, you were gonna, they should see you because you were giving out $50 bills. Cool? Okay, yeah. Um, so, so... <laughs> Yeah, good luck with that one. <laughs> so, 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 well, not good luck like you couldn't have it. You could wrestle it out of me easily. There's nothing in it. Okay. So, <laughs> so, so, so the soil, the first soil is this hard pan that, that the, the word of God never gets in there. And so there's no belief, no salvation. Cool? Let me jump to number three. The third soil, like the seed gets in, and, and, and they believe, and, and there's some change in that person. They become more like Jesus, less of themselves. But it says, Jesus describes it as that the, the seed gets in, and all these other plants, like weeds and thorns and stuff, grow up around it and kind of choke the life out of it. Like it's still living, but you don't see a whole lot of change. That could happen. Maybe that's you, I don't know. The fourth soil is the best soil. That's the soil that's like tilled and ready and the seed goes in and you know those people like they hear the gospel and they are on fire for Jesus, right? They, 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 when you see them, you just, you just feel like you're in the presence of God. They're smiling all the time no matter what happens. They're serving, they're generous, they're quoting scripture to everybody because God has transformed them big time. You used to see them at the bar getting hammered drunk and now they're in church worshiping with their hands held high. Totally changed. Awesome. Awesome. I wish everybody in here was that. But I skip number two. And number two is the person that Jesus is talking to in this story right here, this tree. The second soil is the rocky soil. And it's described this way by Jesus. It says, those who hear the message and receive it with joy. Like they, they, they hear the gospel and they're, they're not mad because some preacher said you're a sinner and you can't help yourself. They're actually relieved. Like, oh, so there's a way? Awesome. I didn't think I could have God love me. I didn't think I could have heaven ever. But there's a way, and they receive that with joy. They're actually happy about that. But something happens. It says that they, they hear the message and they receive it with joy, but since they don't have deep roots, this is scary. It says that they believe for a while, but then fall away. What does it take to be a follower of Christ, to be part of the family of God, to be a Christian? Aren't you supposed to believe in Christ? Isn't that the prerequisite? Well, Jesus, out of his mouth, says that there's some that would believe for a while and then fall away. And I have to tell you that of all the things that are, if you read the Bible, there's nothing more tragic than that. Having tasted the one thing uh, in creation, in this lifetime, that, that nothing else could substitute for. Like, that is the greatest thing, to taste of the Spirit and to know that Jesus is Lord 
and to know that nothing else will satisfy except that, and then to turn from this because you don't pursue it earnestly, because you're not going after Jesus with your whole heart, that you could fall away and believe for a while, but then fall away. When all the while God really wants for us is to be more and more like Jesus, a light in a dark world, a spirit-filled, spirit-led, sweet-smelling, life-giving spirit bringing the gospel and all its beauty to the ends of the earth. That's what Jesus wants. And you know what's remarkable about this truth? Is that at the moment you bend the knee to Jesus and make him the Lord of your life, the scriptures say that he gives you his Holy Spirit and he comes to live in you. And so at the moment that happens, everything you need to be this life, spirit-led, spirit-filled, life-giving spirit, bringing fruit for the kingdom of God, all that you need to accomplish that happens at the moment of conversion, right then and there. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 1.3, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Everyone, nothing that you need to live your Christian life out to its fullest potential, nothing is withheld from you. And if you had said, have said yes to Jesus Christ as of this moment as I speak to you, everything you need to live out everything he wants for your life is in you right now. You don't need to search for it any longer. It's already, it's like Prego. It's in there. It's in there. So he says, I'll, I will save you, and I will change you. Look at your neighbor and say, if you let him. If you let him. Romans 12, 2, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. You have to let this happen. You have to make yourself vulnerable. You have to make yourself open. And listen to this one. You have to make yourself available. If you're busy all day, how's he gonna work on you? And so you have to make yourself available to this. And see, as a believer, we learned this a couple weeks ago, he's got some requirements. The, the God in the Old Testament that had some requirements didn't die. And, 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 and here's a new God over here that's just grace, 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 grace. Do whatever you want, because I still love you. No, God has some requirements. He has some requirements for those that he's invested into. If he's entrusted you with something, he says, no, no, no. I didn't entrust you with the gospel so you could sit, sit at home and go, praise the Lord, I'm going to glory. No, he's entrusted you with that, and then you're supposed to go tell other people about it. That's a responsibility. That's a job. Nobody wants to hear that. I already got a job. I don't need two jobs. Well, you got one. The Bible says that, like, me, if I'm doing something, it says that I'm an unworthy servant doing my duty. That won't fill a church, or maybe it will. You start to rightly understand who God is and what he's really said, you can worship him correctly. And that's what we're looking for. So he's got some requirements that he has. He's got some for the believer. And, and how God deals with the believer in our text that I just read to you, like that's not isolated to this story where you'd be like, oh, well, preach, you took that thing out of context and, and the rest of scripture kind of says this, but this one you're kind of holding on to. You know, some denominations kind of do that, you know? They take one section of scripture. It's like they live and breathe and die on this one little thing. And it's like, don't you know the 66 books? And you're like attached to this one verse. It's a big book. But this text here, this barren, this, this, this fruit, this fig tree, this, what Jesus teaches here, stern, right? But, but it's not isolated to this story. It's actually repeated over and over again. As a matter of fact, I can tell you two places that it's almost identically replicated. And, and, and it's not like, you know, sometimes in the Gospels, there's like a story in Matthew and the same story in, in Luke, Right? But maybe it's, it's told a little bit different because one is a 
this author and this author and two different audiences, but same story. Like I can give you two more, we're gonna go over them, that are not that. But it's the exact same teaching to different people in different situations. Why? We talked about this last week. Why does God repeat himself? It's because he's forgetful and he doesn't realize, oh, I already preached that sermon. Is that what it is? It's because we don't listen. We're, we're stiff-necked Hebrews. And so he repeats himself. So, so here in our text, we see that there's this, can I, can I read it again? Okay, yeah. A man planted a fig tree in his garden and came again and again to see if there was any fruit on it. But he was always disappointed. Finally, he said to his gardener, I've waited three years and there hasn't been a single fig. Cut it down. It's just taking up space in the garden. This is what we would say about someone we don't like, that he's just breathing good oxygen, right? He got real quiet like you guys. I've never said that, no. Maybe you said that, Moses, but I would never say that. I am super holy. The gardener answered, sir, give it one more chance. Leave it another year and I'll give it special attention and plenty of fertilizer. If we get figs next year, fine. If not, then you can cut it down. <clears throat> can I turn your attention to John chapter 15 for a moment? With that lesson fresh in your memory, go a few pages to John 15, and you're going to see a story, uh, not a story, but a, another parable told by Jesus Christ, pretty popular. Uh, maybe you've read it before, but let's just put our eyes to it. Let's read it. I said John, that, that, that Jesus is trying to, re, he's repeating himself because we're not listening. And so we want, to, we want us to, he wants us to rightly understand who he is and what his requirements are so we could worship him correctly. So you guys there at John 15? I heard a no, so I'll wait a minute. All right. So, See if this sounds familiar. Uh, I'm the true, this is Jesus speaking, right, in red. I am the true grapevine. So, so not a tree, but a still a plant, right? Um, agricultural. I'm the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine. That's humongous. For those that would say, well, they were never saved, I would say the word of God just contradicted you. For every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, he prunes the branch, I'm sorry, he cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they'll produce even more. Ever, ever have any, so you're a believer, and, and, but, but then all of a sudden you open up God's word and it says something, takes you to a new level of faith and a new level of trust, and, and you, you read it and you're like, man, I don't really want to do this, right? And so he kind of, he, sometimes he'll kind of force his hand a little bit. He won't like make you do something, but he'll, he, you'll feel the pressure coming down on you, right? You know, it's like, come on, man, do that, do it. And you feel it and you don't really want to do it. That's pruning, that, that's, that's going to the rose bush and clipping off some of the ends, when, and you can just hear the bush going, ah, 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 that kind of hurt, that kind of hurt, but what happens when you trim back the bush? It comes back bigger and more beautiful with more roses on it, right? And, and so that's what God wants in your life. He wants you to be more beautiful, and, and he, wants, he wants to produce more in your life, and so he trims back a couple things, and usually they're things that, that you like, but they're getting in the way of something that's great. Get rid of the good for the great. So clip off some of your good to get you to the great, right? See, we think that the things that we have are, are I love this, you know, the, the gross national product is the, is the total amount of, of goods produced, as if all the stuff that's produced is good. Right? We can look inside the closets and dressers and, and, and cars in our life right now. We could say, oh, look at these things. They're good. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're distracting you from what's great. Maybe you're so deep in debt, you, you have to work a thousand hours a week to pay for the crap that you didn't need. That ain't good at all. Got quiet in here in a hurry. <clears throat> so sometimes what we think is good ain't. It's not at all. 
And so sometimes God's just going to come along with a pair of scissors and just cut that thing off. And you think it's painful. He's trying to release you from that thing's been sucking life out of you. He's actually, you know, a tomato plant has a sucker, right? Anyone ever have any tomato plants? You know, in between the branches, there's this leaf that grows, and it looks just like the other ones. And you're like, oh, great. No, not great. Right? That's a sucker. It's sucking the life out of the tomato plant, but those leaves, no tomatoes ever come out of those. It sucks the life out of the tomato plant. And so sometimes you got suckers in your life, and God comes along and he cuts them off. <clears throat> Get back to the text. He, he says, I'm gonna, uh, every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, he's going to cut them off. And then he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they'll produce even more. Anybody in here want to produce more fruit for the Lord? Amen. I'm all in on that, right? You know it's really cool? You don't have to guess how to do it. He's going to tell you right here. He loves stupid people. He does. I, he loves me, man. I'm so stupid, I couldn't come up with no I tried for 30 years, and I'm so dumb. And all the while, there's that old dusty book just calling my name, and I just said no. He says, you've already been pruned and purified by the message I've given you. So when you get the gospel in you, you've been pruned back quite a bit, right? Anyone testify to that? Yeah, yeah things yeah, that you thought were really cool, and you're not doing that anymore. Uh-huh. Rem- oh, look at this. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. Do you see the dance there? Do you see the, 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 the exchange? Do you see the prerequisite? Do you see the qualifier? Do you see it? Do you see it? Do you see it? Remain in me, and I will remain in you. Now, no, we're not, like, I, Jesus loves stupid people, and I'm, I'm the king of that. But we all know that if that's what he says, then we know the flip side to be true as well. That if we don't, he won't. He's not at a loss of words. Okay, Um, listen to this. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. So do you see the picture? Jesus is the vine, right? And the branch is you, he said, and you can't produce fruit if you're severed from the vine. If you're ever in the vine, it's because you were one of his. If anyone be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has died, behold the new man. So if you're in the vine, would you say you're saved? Yeah. Right? But apart from the vine, if, it's, if you're severed, you can't produce fruit. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me, now doesn't that just tell you that there are some that won't? I pray that no one in this room is that. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. I'm not saying nothing. You're, you're, you're all smart enough. He may love stupid people, of which I am, but we're all smart enough to understand that. Want another one? Romans chapter 11. Is what, see, what we're trying to do here, I don't know about any other church, but what we're trying to do here is, is we're trying to, to load you up with truth so you can worship the real God. Not some ethereal, fun little fantasy thing that you've made up in your own mind that absolutely is going to fail you. The God that I'm, that I'm describing to you that's in his word will never, this is awesome, will never fail you. He will always be this what we read. All the time. That's the God you can grab a hold of and never let go of. And he'll take you straight to glory. Romans chapter 11. So now this is, this is the Apostle Paul. And he's, he's speaking now. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he again talking agricultural terms. Look at verse 
17, we'll just start there. Paul's talking about Jewish people and then those that are not Jewish. He says, um, but some of these branches from Abraham's tree. Okay, so these are the descendants of Abraham. Abraham was the first Jew and God chose the nation of Israel to be his people. Do you guys all understand this, okay? Those are his people. That's Abraham's tree. This is the people that God has called as his own. Some of these branches from Abraham's tree, some of the people of Israel have been broken off. Hmm. And you Gentiles, so the Gentiles are, there, there's two groups of people in the world. According to the Bible, there's Jewish people and then there's others. Anyone else in here Jewish by blood? Other than my daughter, yeah. You wish, right? He wants to be Jewish so bad. Well, you are now. But by blood, right, there's Jewish people and then non-Jewish people. And that's what he's talking about here. He says that, that the people that were Jewish, they were in. But it says they were broken off. The question is, is how did this happen? And you Gentiles, the ones who were not his people that did not believe in him, but now they've turned to him, now they believe in him. It says, but you Gentiles who were branches from a wild olive tree have been grafted in. So now you also receive the blessing God has promised Abraham and his children, sharing in the rich nourishment from the root of God's special olive tree. Now this is, this is the part that's scary. But you must not brag about being grafted in to replace the branches that were broken off. You're just a branch, not the root. Like, don't get too arrogant here, right? I love when God puts me in my place. I, I love when God makes me realize how small I really am. I'm nothing. It's by his grace alone that I'm saved. It's by his grace alone that I draw another breath. And I like to be reminded of that to get me off my high horse. Some of us need to be knocked down. You need to be knocked down right now. I'll come right down off this stage and knock you down. No, I'm just kidding. Some of us need it, right? Some of us need it. I'm sending Dana to do it. <laughs> I'm so big and bad. All right. Don't brag. You're just a branch, not the root. Watch this. Well, you may say, those branches were broken off to make room for me. Yes. But remember, those branches were broken off because they didn't believe in Christ. So can I stop there for a second? So here's the, I'm Jewish. I was born and raised a Jew. We went to temple. I believed in God. I did. I knew there was a creator. I knew there was something going on that kind of governed stuff and made stuff. I get it. And I heard all the old stories about Noah and Moses and all that kind of stuff, right? But then all of a sudden, 2,000 years ago, God comes down as his child, Jesus. And so now it's the, it's the, the onus of responsibility goes to the creation to receive that which God has done and accept it. I can't impose my idea of who God should be on God. He's, he's the one who decides this. And so he decides that from now on, instead of just believing in some God with these commandments, now this God who made those commandments is coming down here. And you, if you want to believe in me, you've got to believe in what I'm doing. That, that, that's it. And so what happened is the Jewish people who for, for centuries had been worshiping this God, they knew this God, but when he, when this God came down in the person of Jesus Christ, they said, no, stiff arm, I don't want that. And so he has proclaimed himself through Jesus Christ to the world. And the Jewish people said, nah, -uh. heck nah, I'm not doing that. And so what does it say? Because of that, they were broken off because they didn't believe in Christ. And you are there because you do believe. So don't think highly of yourself, but fear what could happen. For if God did not spare the original branches, he won't spare you either. 
Notice how God is both kind and severe. We're going to talk about that in a minute. He is severe towards those who disobey, but kind to you if you listen to this. If you continue to trust in his kindness. But if you stop trusting, you also will be cut off. And if the people of Israel turn from their unbelief, they'll be grafted in again. So he is very stern, very clear, that if you don't let him transform who you are and work on you and believe in him and trust in him, if your life doesn't reflect that, what happens? Wham! I'm not the author, man. I didn't write this. And I don't like it either. But you just read it in three places. God repeating himself to be, to be absolute clarity of truth. Not just some isolated scripture, remote scripture in Haggai that you just pull out and go, oh, but in Obadiah it says, no. Three times in big books, in popular sections, God makes it quite clear. You don't, if I save you and you're in my family and you don't let me transform you and you don't change, wham, you're out. I didn't make it up. It says it. And we want to worship the right God. The right God is the God of the Bible, and that's what it says. You're all looking at me like three heads. But a life displaying deeper levels of belief and deeper levels of trust will look a certain way. It'll be lived out a certain way, actions reflecting this trust. You'll see it lived out in the believer. The Bible will tell us in Philippians 1.27 to conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. <clears throat> you know, uh, nothing wrong with working at McDonald's, but let, let me, how much is a person, uh, you start at McDonald's, how much are you making? How much, you know, eight, nine, ten bucks an hour or something? I don't know. Ten bucks an hour? Right? Ten bucks an hour, right? So, 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 what's that? I can't hear you. I, listen, I'm, I'm going there. Eight, nine, ten bucks an hour? Okay. Okay. Some of us get snippy with them. But if you think about it right now in a calm situation when you're not at the drive through and they've messed up your order, do you really have high expectation? Do you think, I mean, the, the management and the owner of the store might have higher expectation for them than you do. But when someone's working at McDonald's for eight or nine bucks an hour, we don't have massive expectations. But what if someone's pulling like 2.3 mil down? What do you think their company is asking of them? Right? You got it? The, 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 the greater the investment, the greater the requirement. Right? I mean, we just have high expectations, you know, like we expect when you get paid eight or nine bucks an hour, even though we don't like it, that they're just going to not show up or show up late or st show up drunk or stinking from booze or whatever. We, we kind of expect that now. But if you pay your, your employee 2.3 mil, you don't expect they're going to show up half baked. Come on, right? We have higher expectations. And when you start to understand the value of the gospel, the infinite value of the gospel, the infinite value of a, of a life that is beyond repair and that God himself has gone to the cross to, 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 to live and to die for you so you could be saved, that's worth more than 2.3. And when you start realizing the value of the gospel, he's like, listen, based on that, Live a life that's worthy of the gospel. Do you see the scales? On this side of the scale is, is Jesus Christ who's perfect and goes to the cross and suffers torture and humiliation and pain and death so that you don't have to. So based on that, how would you live your life according to that? Live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel. It's what Jesus would call fruit. Fruit. In these two examples that we've read here in our text in Luke 13 and in our text in John 15 with the vine. And he's not talking about, you know, well, I'm more patient 
and I'm kinder, and I'm more gentle, and I, I have more self-control. These declarations with no substantive action are worthless. He don't want to hear you telling him that. Because if you look back in the text here in Luke 13, what does it say? It says, uh, I came again and again to see if there was any fruit. He, he came to see some things. He wants evidence. He, he's a fruit inspector. He came to, to, to look and see some evidence of transformation, to see some evidence of growth in your life. He wants to see the character of Christ increasing in you and the ministry of Christ flowing from you. That's what he wants. Is that what's happening in your life? How's that going? How's that going? Don't, don't, just, don't just blow off and say, well, let's get to the next point, man. No, how's that going? Because he's, he's looking for that. You, you see it in the text. The, the father's coming. He's looking. He's saying, have, have you changed? Are you different now? Are you more Christ-like today than you were a year ago? Are you, is there more ministry and more kingdom advancement being done through your life right now than it was a year or two ago? He's looking for that. He's looking for evidence of transformation, evidence of growth and change. He's looking for that. Do you know... Um, Here's, here's a fourth example in Scripture of this truth, and it's found in Matthew 7. This was like an afterthought. Like, I didn't plan on doing this, but it's like, you know what, i got to do this. So, so here in Matthew chapter 7, here's Jesus speaking again. And, and in this text here, starting in verse 15, he, he's, he's not necessarily talking just about you. He's talking about these false prophets, these ones that are saying things like on behalf of God, but they're really not. They're, they're, te they're telling people lies. And, and look what he says here in Matthew 7, 15. He says, beware of the false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but they're really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit. There it is again. You can identify them by their fruit. I love this. That is by the way they act. That's fruit. Right? God says, and he comes back in, in Luke 13, he says, I came back to the garden to see some things. I want to see evidence that you're actually allowing me to come in and change who you are. And not just the way you think, but taking those thoughts and putting them into action for the kingdom of God. Are you changing or are you just coming to church? And he says, you can identify them by their fruit, that is by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit, and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. Listen to this. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. See, the only difference between this story and the last one is that God is coming to look and see if there's fruit in your life, if, you've had any, if there's any evidence of change in your life. He's looking, and he can see it. And what this is saying is the same exact thing, but now he's saying, listen, you guys can see it too. But right now you're probably thinking about somebody, when all the while you should be thinking about yourself. Look in the mirror. This is written to you, not to your wife or your husband or your friend. This is written to you. You'll be able to see the fruit. In all four instances, we clearly see that if we don't let God work in us so that our lives show, show true evidence of being a new creation, God himself cuts the believer off from him. It is written. I'm not the author. <clears throat> this parable also teaches us some things about God, about his nature and his character that you need to know. And the first thing that you need to understand is that God is a stern father with expectations. He is.
Is there any fruit on that tree? If not, cut it down. If I don't see any fruit on this tree, I'm going to cut it down. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict us of sin. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict us of God's righteousness. And it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict us of the coming judgment that we see right here. So in other words, he's, the Holy Spirit will tell us, uh, this is who you are, convict you of your sin, this is who you are. You're a person who is guilty of sin. But he's also convicting you of God's righteousness. In other words, he's saying, this is who you are. You can't help yourself. But this is who God is. And because you bent the knee to Jesus, now you're righteous. So the next thing is convicting of judgment. So what he's saying is, this is who you are. This is who you are now. What are you doing with it? That's the Holy Spirit tugging on you probably tonight, right now. What are you doing with that that I've gave you? When you said yes to Jesus Christ, his Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, came to, to live in you. And along with that, he deposited spiritual gifts inside of you to build up his kingdom. There's judgment. What are you doing with that? I have requirements. What are you doing with that? There should be a sense of urgency in you all. And maybe not for salvation. Maybe today, as you sit here, you're a saved man or a saved woman. But all that God has entrusted in you, what are you doing with it? There should be a sense of urgency stirring up inside of you right now, saying, I'm not all I should be, and I'm not doing all that I should do with what you've given me, Lord. And you see what happens in all of these texts when you don't allow God to, to do something in you and responding to that and growing and maturing and serving. Like, if that's not happening, if you're not producing fruit, what does he do? Cuts you off. I'm gonna read to to me, is probably the scariest verse in all of Scripture. And I asked my wife, who's been in church, she's 40, 44 years old, she's been in church her whole life, and she told me that she's never heard this verse preached. Never. And maybe you're going to feel the same way when I read it to you. But if it's in God's Word, it must be important. And for us to properly understand who God is, to worship him correctly, we have to read this. And we have to agree with this. Luke, just listen up. You can write the reference, you can check it later, but listen up and listen carefully. This is as serious as a heart attack. Luke 12, 5, Jesus says, but I'll tell you whom to fear. Fear God who has the power to kill you and throw you into hell. yes. He's the one to fear that never gets preached. Never gets preached. Why would it? That's not going to make everyone feel good. That's not going to make everyone encouraged. It's not going to make you feel better about yourself. Preachers don't preach this. So even though God is stern... And to be feared, he's also the God who's realizing you can't fix your sin problem. And although he's the one who's got the power to kill and cast into hell, his love is so strong. Romans 5.8 says that he shows his great love to us by sending his son to die for us while we were yet sinners. Same God. You can't pick and choose which one of those gods you like. He's both. 
He's a God of wrath and he's a God of love. He's a God of compassion and he's a God of anger. He's both. <clears throat> Here's the second thing we learn about God in this text that he is very patient. Very patient. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone appreciative of his patience? Yeah. Clapping is good. <clears throat> so, so why is it you know, I got saved and I'm, I'm on the mission field now and I'm planting churches and I'm praying three hours a day and I'm memorizing scripture and I'm baptizing people that are like, boom, it's the way it should be, right? Boom, 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 right? No, no, no. Well, some people are like that. I mean, I, I'm not the only one in the room who's like that. That's what happened to me. I praise God for it. And some of you are that way. You got saved like crazy saved, right? I know some people up in here that are crazy saved. <clears throat> but, but, but look at the text, though. Is it like that for everybody? He says that the man planted a fig tree in his garden, and he came, look, again and again. We could just go, and again and again. And again, because we don't know how many times, we don't know how many agains there were. Just again and again. Multiple times. To see if there was any fruit on it. And he was always disappointed. Again and again. What does it say here? I've waited three years. Patient God. Patient God. Thank God for his patience. Again and again, three years. And then here's the good news, you ready? Then you get a one-year extension. That's a pretty good deal. Why, do you, why, why the one-year extension? Why, why, why the one, he says, he, oh, let me read, he says, uh, for, I've waited three years and there's no fruit. Cut that thing down, right? I have the power to kill and cast in hell. We read that, right? You read it. It's not very appetizing. It's not stirring me up in, in affections for God that he has the power to kill me and put me in hell. Like, I, but that's in the Bible. I, I didn't make it up. But, but what happens, the gardener, someone say praise Jesus. Right? He's a, he, you got to do it in a Southern Baptist tone too because that's Jesus who's doing this. Praise Jesus. Right? So praise Jesus. He, the gardener, Jesus, sir, uh, father, give it one more chance. Leave it another year and I'll give it special attention and plenty of fertilizer so we could get some figs, right? So, so, so why the one-year extension? Because of Jesus. Romans 8.34 says this, this good news. Christ Jesus died for us. Say amen. amen. Raised to life for us amen. and is sitting at the place of honor at, fa at the Father's right hand pleading for us. That's why you get an extra year. Yeah. Jesus is pleading for you right now. Right now he's pleading. That's why the extra time. And so if you can hear my voice right now echoing his voice to you, then you right now are receiving special attention and fertilizer. That's what you're getting. God wants to advance his church through you. You're his plan. You're his plan. And a real disciple multiplies more disciples. Do you understand this? Multiplying and reproducing requires what? Fruit. It's where the seeds are, right? He wants to produce in you those things that are reproducible in others. God is looking to see Jesus reproduced in you so your fruit will help others to grow the same. Amen? God desires to produce in you something that can be reproduced, for sure. Disciples that make disciples. And so let me, let me close with these two clear uh, word pictures that are right here in, in Luke chapter 13. 
Right here in Luke chapter 13 is some, uh, this is the good news, right? This is the good news. In Luke chapter 13, just right there on the same page, look at verse 20. So here's Jesus Christ still speaking, and he's giving us the flip side to what you just heard. The, the tree that is not producing fruit for him, like, it's just not happening. The roots aren't growing down deep. I'm not, you're not producing anything in your life for me. I can't see any evidence in your life. Nothing's happening. Chop. But here's the flip side to it. Verse 20 says this. Can I get the worship band up, please? It says this. What else does the kingdom of God look like? What's it like? It says this. It's, it's like a yeast that a woman used in making bread. I've never done any cooking before, but you guys know what yeast is? That's the thing that makes it rise, right? So what is it? And, and, and I've never done any of that cooking, any of that baking. Yeah, if you have a big old loaf of bread, you don't have to use a lot of yeast, do you? You don't have to use a whole lot. So what happens here, it says, um, it's like the yeast a woman used in making bread, even though she put only a little yeast in three measures of flour, look, this much, in this much, what happens? The yeast permeates every part of the dough. So, so what it's saying here is that when the gospel is, is, is delivered to you and his Holy Spirit is now indwelling you, that that's going to permeate, every, listen up, that's going to permeate every part of your life. It's going to permeate your mind so you're going to think differently. It's going to permeate your heart so you're going to worship differently. It's going to permeate your will so you act differently. You see? That's what he's saying here. So, so if, he's, if he's giving you new life, then those things should be happening in your life. The gospel, God's word, should enter into your life and change every single thing about you. Everything. If you haven't seen someone since you became a Christian, they should go, who are you again? They wouldn't even know who you are because you're totally different. Totally different. But listen, it doesn't, it doesn't stop there. The last thing is here in Luke 13, verse 18. This is awesome because this is an agricultural example, just like we've been using all night. And Jesus says this, what is the kingdom of God like? How can I illustrate it? This is brilliant. It's like a tiny mustard seed that a man planted in the garden. You hear the words are very similar, right? Planted in the garden. It grows, it becomes a tree, and the birds make nests in its branches. You see, the difference is that sometimes the gospel gets into you, and you don't allow God to work in you, so there's no evidence of change. And that tree gets cut off. But then there's the tree that goes after the Lord with their whole heart. And that tree grows, and it becomes beautiful, and it provides life for others. You see the picture? And that's what God is looking for in you. Our motto here at our church, this statement of well, who we are, it says that we're a gospel-centered, uh, I'm sorry, a gospel-centered, culture-creating community bringing beauty to the world. What he's looking for in all of you is to be trees of life. That he would be in you and you'd be alive in him and you would provide life. You'd be a life-giving spirit to all those around you. Can you see the birds in their nests in your tree? That's what he wants for you. Yeah. Hard message. Hard message. Not popular. And I just got to tell you that as I, when I gave my heart to Jesus and I started reading the Bible, I started reading things that were very contradicting to what I was being taught. And this was one of them. Massive. Massive. And if you're having trouble stomaching what I've shared with you tonight, I would just offer this to you. Like it says in the book of Acts, do as the Bereans did. Take what I've spoken to you tonight and compare it to the Word of God and see if it's true. If it's true, you can worship the real God. If it's not true, throw it out and worship the real God. Amen? Okay. Would you come to your feet, please?
want to share one thing with you before you get to sing. If the tree does not bear fruit, God the Father cuts it off. But the good news is this. If your life is that life and you haven't been producing fruit and there's been no big change in your life and you're sensing like, that's me, Lord. I got saved two, three, five, ten years ago and I'm really not any further along in my relationship with the Lord than I was back then. I, I don't see any greater evidence of character of Christ in my life and I don't see increase in ministry, Jesus' ministry through my life. I just don't see it. Maybe you, 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 you're feeling it because you've been cut off. But here's the great news. That same God that gave you that word also says this. Jesus says that by no means will I ever turn away anyone who turns to me. Amen. Amen. Anyone. So if you felt cut off from the vine and you're not feeling it, you can get grafted right back in right now and be absolutely sure of your relationship with the Lord. If you'd like to do that, I know that our dear sister in Christ, Kim, right there, who was baptized tonight, she would love to pray with you. She's going to be right over here, and she would love to pray with you. And I need... Tom, please, would you come forward, please? I want a man and a woman up here just in case you feel a little funky. <laughs> Tom's up here too. And he would love to pray with you as well. At least I hope he would love to. I kind of recruited him. But I know his heart and I know he would. So if you'd like to just pray and just say, God, I, I, I've, 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 listen, it's okay to say, you know what, God, I've totally failed. I haven't done what you've asked of me, but I want to get back on track. Would you receive me back in right now? And he absolutely would. You just do it in prayer. It's just talking to God. So if you'd like to do that or you'd like to pray about anything, you need prayer, you're sick, you're hurting, whatever it is, you want to pray with them, they just want to pray with you, all right? And I want to pray with you all right now, just all of us together, and then we're going to sing to the Lord, right? Amen? Father, um, I'm sure that most of the people in this room are um, maybe enjoying hearing this message as much as I enjoyed hearing it from you. Yeah, not at all. But I do thank you, Lord, that you've given us your words so that we could have with clarity an understanding of who you really are. So we don't have to go through life wondering who this mysterious God is. There's enough mystery in you to go around. And we're glad that in this situation, we, don't, we have clarity. We're not, it's not mystery. You've been clear with us of the truth of who you are and what you expect and what you will do. And so, Lord, I thank you for that clarity tonight. Now, based on your word about spirit and truth, you have filled us with your truth tonight so that now that we can worship you in spirit with our life. Thank you for that. Lord, we bless you. We praise you. And we thank you for allowing us to come into your house and hear your word. In Jesus' name.